Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zero Week Conversation brought to you by IHS Market. My name is Jim Jansen, and I'm a senior manager in our Clean Energy Technology Division, where I lead our research on energy storage. Today, we'll be talking about how energy storage can support the energy transition and how future technology pathways could play out. And I'm delighted to have two fantastic panelists to discuss this with today. First, we have Jeff Brown, who's the president of Power & Energy, a major integrator of lithium-ion batteries and energy storage systems. Jeff, welcome to Zero Week Conversations. Julian, thanks for having me. And we're joined by Janice Lim, who's the CEO of Stratagen and a leading clean energy change maker who co-founded the California Energy Storage Alliance and most recently the Green Hydrogen Coalition as well. Janice, great to have you on board here at Zero Week Conversations. Thanks, Julian. So let me set the scene a bit. Because with over half of US states adopting renewable energy goals and countries across the world setting ambitious targets for renewable deployment, we really see the need for long duration bulk energy storage heightening. And I think this is further evidence, not just by the curtailed renewable electricity that we're seeing in the grid today, but also by recent events on the West Coast of the United States, which are really highlighting the need for resiliency as we are transforming our energy system. So matching abundant, low-cost renewable generation supply with demand throughout the year will require significant deployment of energy storage, including multi-day and seasonal storage, because otherwise, I think we're all very confident in this, clean energy policy goals will not be met. So I'm really excited to discuss this with both of you. And maybe to get started straight away, I throw the first question um, at you, Janice, because you're very involved in the street. And why do you think we need energy storage to meet our renewable goals? Yeah, so it's um, my answer to that is uh, quite simple, is we need energy storage to match production with demand because demand and production aren't always uh, happening exactly at the same time. And energy storage makes renewable energy, which is the lowest cost form of energy at the margin today, dispatchable and able to compete head on with fossil fuels. Historically, we would just have renewable energy when it's created, the solar and wind, but with energy storage, we can have it whenever we need it. We can increase resilience. And most importantly, I'd like to talk about this later, it's an opportunity to expand the potential of renewable energy even beyond the power sector. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think it's not just linked to the power sector, but much wider. And I'm hoping that throughout the discussion, we can kind of link back to that. But maybe um, throwing on the question over to Jeff, um, especially with a nod to recent developments on the West Coast of the US, to what extent do you see the need for resiliency and the role that primarily battery energy storage today can play to provide that? I mean, I, it, is, it is the reason that the Powen is, is in the business that we are. We started this company and this initiative uh, over four years ago to build uh, a product that would enable a renewable and resilient future. Um, you know, as Janice was saying, renewable energy is, is not dispatchable, despite the, the, the fundamental underlying economics of, the, of what it can do from, uh, at a, uh, achieving a low cost of energy. But without low cost storage, you don't have an ability to achieve any of our, uh, of our long-term renewable goals. And as we're seeing on the grid right now, as, as California has taken the lead in transitioning their grid over to a renewable future, they are not gonna be able to uh, achieve the resiliency that they need without some long-term capacity assets. And, and products like Palins and uh, uh, allow them to achieve that uh, uh, goal. Yeah, and I'd like to um, jump in and just build on something Jeff said that it, it, it is about achieving our renewable goals. I will be the first to support goals for renewables, <laughs> very focusing. However, it's not just about achieving those goals for goal's sake. Um, let's face it, renewable energy is the affordable, smart decision for consumers and rate payers. So storage is enabling a lower cost, much lower cost, supply going forward and of course a cleaner healthier environment absolutely and i think you touched up on a really core issue there it's, it's an enabling technology fundamentally right it doesn't generate electricity but enables us 
to achieve those goals and enables us to have a more resilient electricity network. Maybe along those lines, and I'll throw it back to you, Jeff, what technologies are dominating the market today that we're seeing in the United States and globally, um, and why is that the case? The technical challenge of storing energy is something that has been solved for hundreds of years. Um, that is not a, it is not a, a new solution. We're doing it with pumped hydro. We're doing it with uh, gravity devices for hundreds of years. The difference and the thing that is is really changed over the last five years is that you can now store energy at a cost that is really competitive and provides a true alternative to the other energy grid. So what we saw, and we saw the coming transition with the investment in EV batteries, um, the growth of renewable penetration, and, and just the true mathematical ceiling of how much renewable penetration you're going to be able to achieve, that there was a real need for someone to be able to build a storage product at a price point that is able to deliver the value of storage at a, an, a market acceptable cost. And I think that's the big, that, that's, that's where we're focused and that's what we're really, uh, that's what we believe the market needs is people being focused on actually market acceptable solutions. Um, there is a, there's a lot of initiative going forward to be able to bring storage out there. That, um, that, uh, that support and the, that, uh, that market growth will dwindle if we can't find ways to continue to drive down the overall price of the service so that we're actually able to store multiples of renewable energy that we actually have right now. And I think that's a really good point that you mentioned that storing multiples of renewable energy that we have. And maybe Janice, I know you have looked across so many different technologies and you've been a real advocate across this industry for a long time. So how do we get or what is driving the need for and how do we get to a point where we see more longer duration bulk energy storage to actually store those multiples of renewable energy? Because right now, it's still a fairly small amount of storage that we have on the grid. Yeah, this is true. I, um, uh, I also wanted to add to what Jeff said a moment ago that costs are falling quite dramatically, especially for lithium ion batteries buoyed by the underlying expansion of EVs. And another advantage of batteries is they're very modular. They have a small footprint. You can install them in dense urban locations. And the other advantage that batteries had is that suppliers tend to be large companies. So they're a nice counterparty for developers and utilities. And that has enabled them coupled with current market rules to really achieve a dominant share uh, for new storage installations. Now, um, most of those batteries that have been installed have been for a relatively shorter duration, so four or five hours or less. And as you uh, rightly point out, Julian, um, as we progress and have greater penetrations of very low cost renewable energy, what's going to happen over time is that the need for storage will shift from primarily a shorter duration capacity application to more of an energy shifting application. For example, the Public Utility Commission here in California, their integrated resources plan, the sort of the baseline case shows a need for seven hours of storage, seven hours duration in 2030. Historically, most of the storage, I'd say by far more than 90%, and uh, procured here in California to date has been four hours or less. Um, another driver is local capacity constraints. Sometimes you have a, a load pocket and you just don't have enough generation there and um, modeling has shown in some of these local capacity uh, areas, you need a much longer duration, like nine or 10 hours to maintain reliability. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say about longer duration, if you think about um, how we're going to move to more of an energy shifting application, consider a 100% renewable scenario so that all of the load is met by the lowest cost renewable resource, which is wind and solar. And clearly those mismatch, there's some coincidence, but in that case, we will need multi-day and even seasonal storage, which is the longest duration there is in the course of a year. Absolutely. And talking about that multi-day seasonal storage, of course, there's a lot of technologies that are competing and maybe just st st staying on the point of 
lithium ion batteries for one minute here, Jeff, to what extent or how, to what duration extent do you think lithium ion batteries will be able yeah. to take a significant Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a, I wouldn't so much call it a misnomer, but it's always something I find that need to sort of clarify and explain about the duration of, of, of lithium ion batteries. You know, rewind the clock eight years or so, and most lithium ion installations were sub 30 minutes, right? And that wasn't so much a feature of the fundamental technology. It was really a feature of the market. Um, the market that they were addressing was um, frequency regulation and PJM, for, as an example, and short duration and why did they address things there. It wasn't like there weren't capacity needs eight years ago. It was because the price of uh, lithium ions was so high, it really only made sense in these super thin ancillary markets that drove, uh, that drove us to, uh, uh, that drove those installations first. And, you know, a ton of great work went to, and, and, and frankly, Powen is a, and, and to talk about a market evolving isn't to undercut the original installations. I mean, we exist because of those initial projects happening. We're, we're growing. And I think I then see a trajectory is, as it made sense for uh, to do 30 minute installations eight years ago, it makes a lot of sense now to do peaking capacity at durations in, you know, at four hours in, in areas like California um, and areas where you, where they're peaking, where the real, that, that peak capacity window was pretty narrow and pretty predictable. It makes a lot of sense for lithium ion to be able to, to target that. And really what the reason is, is those are, those are, they are partially initially driven, but the fundamentally economics really, really support new build of, of storage over uh, over a fossil application, over alternate capacity resources. But to 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 you know, so just forecast into the future, there's no reason that four hours is the limit for a store for a lithium ion storage system. You just you basically just have to put more. It is actually a vastly easier technologically to, to do an eight hour lithium ion battery, your thermal load is really, really minimal. Your ancillary loads are minimal, you have minimal balancing concerns. There's no reason that you can't, you, you couldn't push in that direction, but there are fundamental competing um, sort of market issues. How often can you cycle it? What's the true arbitrage value once you get to that level that starts to push back on the actual effectiveness of those types of systems. So what do we see? I mean, we have, Built and we're in, the, in, uh, in uh, contracted on you know four hour longer four hour systems. We've got six and eight and twelve hour systems in our in our in our pipeline, but the vast majority is in that three to four range. And we expect really for the next several years that that is that's a vast market. You're talking about gigawatts and gigawatts of power. That that if you can, if we as a, you know, as an industry can demonstrate that we can get four hour resilient solutions, you know, after these, all these big storage projects come online in California, if we can go for a season of no of outages because of what that storage is able to do, it should really change people's mindset that wait, this is, these are, these are no different than regular capacity assets that utilities have been putting in IRPs and building for years. And then once you've done that, like once you've gotten that next win for the, the, the next resiliency asset that you go with the storage asset, you're removing fossil assets off the off the um, off the table, off their off their plan. And I see it change where you just where where it's not it won't happen overnight. It doesn't replace all the energy assets, but most of the new build, just like we're already seeing in clean energy, most of the new build. At clean energy, most of the new build energy assets are renewable. I expect most of the new build capacity assets to be stored. I think you touched upon a really good point there. I mean, of course, cost trajectories are quite important, but you mentioned the term value quite a lot there. And I think what you're mentioning there is the the, the gap um, or the, the net peak gap um, that we can address over the next five to 10 years with, let's say, four to six hour battery storage. But beyond that, once we're pushing, you know, towards 70, 80 percent renewable pe penetration. As we're electrifying our transport sectors, um, our heating sectors, we need to look a lot broader. And the problem though that I see there is that how do we value that type of storage? Because our markets have not traditionally been set up to give value to those kind of long duration assets across different industries, especially. So, um, Janice, like how do we value those types of energy storage systems, and how do we incentivize that uptake without subsidies? 
Yeah, that's a, this question of how do we value and procure is, you know, exactly the million dollar question, so to speak. I mean, there's a reason that most of the storage in California has been procured to date has been four hours because guess what? Our resource adequacy product that utilities must buy is a four hour product. And the challenge with that is, you know, there's, there's the arbitrariness of how we've designed our market and the products we've set up. And then there's the underlying need of keeping the lights on. And as the system changes and evolves, the underlying, uh, the, the product set is not keeping up with the need, so to speak. And, uh, and, and I do agree, I think lithium ion can do longer hours, but as we start pushing into eight, nine, maybe 10 hours uh, that's needed now in certain local capacity constraints, um, there are a whole diversity of different storage solutions available um, that uh, may separate capacity from energy where the energy component is the size of the tank and additions in hours may be, uh, you know, marginal additions to hours of capacity are relatively cheaper than a more of a solid state um, battery construction like lithium ion. Now, that doesn't mean it's either or. Uh, personally, I believe we need a lot of solutions in the grid. There's a lot of grid needs, but uh, this question of long duration storage and uh, personally, the, I believe the reason that we don't have more long duration is because we haven't had the correct market products and compensation mechanisms to compensate long duration storage solutions for the services they provide. For example, um, we have four hours, but you know, if you haven't noticed, we've, we've had uh, some pretty long rolling blackouts here. <laughs> Up and down the coast. I heard there was a blackout in Portland too. Um, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe we should think about um, valuing and paying storage providers for their reliability contributions to the grid. So maybe um, we should be paying for resource adequacy, not just in this arbitrary four hour block, but it, that's dictated by more of a megawatt or a capacity measure, a power measure, but by the size of the tank, let's look at the hours that you can deliver. We don't have a product like that today. Um, we don't have a payment mechanism for a storage solution that can provide multi-day or seasonal storage. We spend a lot of money on multi-day and seasonal storage. It's called fossil fuels stored in the pipeline or in an underground reservoir. But storage is the, is the new kid on the block with renewables and we don't have a way um, of paying for this really low cost, superior alternative. Um, so this is the core problem. Our current integrated resources planning processes um, don't consider the ability to store renewable energy in the form of green hydrogen and use it as a drop-in fuel replacement or as a multi-day and seasonal storage solution. And currently um, our local requirements are not really planned and procured in a differentiated way than they should be. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's <laughs> a lot of really interesting points there. And I think the, the essence of what you're saying is there's a lot of great technologies out there, but in many cases, we just don't provide the revenue streams or the valuation that actually say, look, this is not an asset like a normal gas peaker plant. Mm -hmm. This is a very flexible, versatile asset that can provide so many different services to the grid. Um, to consumers, to the utilities, and we need to find ways to actually appreciate that value and, and, and provide the relevant um, revenue drivers um, to encourage more technology diversity in a sense as well. And um, maybe Jeff, then on that point of technology diversity, now I know you're very firmly um, you know, embedded in the lithium ion space, but you know, you're also looking at the wider landscape and you're looking at other technologies coming in, um, either to compete or be complementary to your technology. How do you think the landscape could change on the technology side? One thing that what, what Janice said that I, I, I try and make sure whenever I'm talking, we always I emphasize this, the, the value of storage and frankly, the value of the entire energy market is driven by the policymakers. It's driven by the people that create the market. The, 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 Janice, you're totally right. Four hours is, it, it, it is not, 
It is fundamentally on some level arbitrary. It was decided, it was based on how they came up with it, but it was in, it was designed as a way to sort of address some system need. And it was a way to address a system need based on the resources that they had available 10 or 15 years ago. I think the really important thing that we can do all as an industry is talk about how the available resources have changed, how the actual price point have changed, how the price point of renewable energy has changed, the price point of storage has changed. And when people design IRPs and it takes 36 months to actually get something done, that price point is going to be dramatically different just a few years in the future. And I really, really encourage people uh, that are actually sitting in, uh, in the, in the responsible for designing these IRPs and really thinking carefully about how we how we meet our long term market goals. So, you know, engage with, you know, people like Janice and ourselves that actually know what's going to be coming around the corner, know what the actual cost points are going to be. So we have a market that's already designed for that technology when it, when it arrives. Um, it's, it's really, really important. So often we're in a place where the market just isn't like, uh, you're, we're, we're like, well, guys, we could do this if you just go change these silly rules. And they're saying, oh, well, it's going to take five years. Like, well, we sort of told you five years ago. So I think, and everybody wants the same thing here, but um, I just think that it's the pace of change, particularly in storage. And that's, you know, that's where we, uh, you know, live and breathe every day. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. But I think it's, it's across the entire market it is really, really significant. And it's worth it for the people that are, um, you know, that have the responsibility of designing these future markets. They are the ones that will create this. this nothing gets built without the market being there. I can't just will batteries onto the grid. It's going to need to get paid for. So, and that only happens with the market. So I just think that that's super, super important. And, in, and, um, and, uh, and I think that it's, as we can, as we think about these different technologies, doesn't on some level like the, the technology question is sort of fascinating, but it's also a little bit beside the point if we don't have the markets that actually fundamentally enable it. It doesn't. It's it is it is not something that can happen without the fundamental mm -hmm. market. Every, literally everything we're talking about was invented 50 years ago. There is nothing here that is new. It's except for the fact that we are actually making the societal and manufacturing and sort of technological change to bring it into reality. And, I, and that's why I think it's really important to think about this as these are communication and will issues, not just sort of fundamental technology issues. And that's, and that's not always true in, in all spaces. Uh, we just quickly to your actual question of what are we, what's actually coming around the corner. Um, yeah, I mean, we are, on my technology, we are not, I mean, it's outside of just, you know, light bedtime reading around the storage, the, the what type of uh, long duration storage is coming. And there's some really fascinating stuff and some awesome work being done. Um, uh, we really focused on the near term improvement in lithium batteries. Like Allen is intended on, we want to bring product to market. So we're looking at stuff that is not 10 years out. We're looking at stuff that's three years out. We're looking at what not not a we're not looking at a lab bench we're looking at stuff what is about to hit the market what can a developer what can a utility actually plan for what are those price points and frankly it's super exciting you know we're seeing batteries lithium ion batteries cycle them every single day for 20 years you're talking about basically matching the lifetime of a solar project um that's a that is and now you're talking about being able to do this it, the, people sort of you sort of keep presuming there's some floor here we're seeing some of the core clusters that we're getting and actual real bids is very, very impressive. I continue to see this, uh, pick a number on it, five to seven percent reduction in overall system delivered cost uh, for the foreseeable future. And every year that that happens, your total addressable market gets bigger. You get more investment in it, you get more capital going to it. We're just now at the stage where we're sort of a big enough industry for people in banks and financing to be paying attention to us. Um, that is that is not going away, and and um, and I think you know I'm happy to dive in deep on the chemistries on some of this stuff. But fundamentally, we we really look at this technology as a dollar per kilowatt hour. It could be twelve different lithium ion variants, which there's some really great forecasts of which ones they're going to be. But we we care about the service. We care about the value that the great guests. Um, so 
that's a, that's a non-answer, Julian. But uh, I actually think it's a really good point because you're showing the investment that's coming in and and the pathway we're on for the for the short term. And so maybe if we think a bit long term, what you said earlier, Janice, I want to kind of come back to that as a kind of final point. So you said it's not just about the electricity sector, right? This is a much broader issue, and I think when we look beyond the next three to five years, tackling that issue of sector coupling and cutting across different industries with storage as a key enabling technology, uh, that's really going to be the really difficult thing to think of. I mean, we're already in a challenging situation, but that's where it's going to be very difficult for both the industry and policymakers and regulators to get ahead around this and, and bring this together. So how do you see that playing out? Well, um, very exciting times indeed. And uh, I, I, on the this issue of regulatory innovation, it is so key. Um, to innovate on the market design. That's what CISA, why CISA was formed, um, really, is, is to chart a pathway forward in partnership with our policymakers and regulators so that storage can compete head on with status quo solutions. And what I wanted to say about that is the, the market innovation is equally as important as the technology innovation, and they can't happen in isolation. One informs the other um, and vice versa. Uh, and the innovation that happens in the market also doesn't happen in a vacuum. And uh, technology companies like Powen and others can engage with utilities and regulators to um, encourage that innovation. Because sometimes you don't even realize a market innovation is possible unless you know there's a technological capability to deliver those services. And if the regulators don't know that, how, how would they design the market? And, and the very act of pushing the market in a certain direction may enable a whole class of technological innovations to flourish and succeed. So it's a, it's a real give and take. And, uh, and I mentioned utilities too, because they're a very important stakeholder in all of this. And, um, you know, they're facing lots of challenges to their business model. It's no longer a centralized planning model. There's technology all over the place. We have distributed resources. We have uh, now greater, as you say, Julian, sector coupling between say power and gas and transportation through EVs and hydrogen and fuel cell EVs. We always thought that the uh, storage was a bit of a silo buster because in the power sector, it fits in transmission, distribution, generation, and load. And then when you start thinking about other forms of storage and say using green hydrogen as a storage mechanism, well, that's a really super flexible molecule that can now take renewable energy and decarbonize the gas sector, gasoline, diesel, even sectors that we thought were never possible to decarbonize, such as long haul aviation and shipping. So it's really changing the name of the game. And when you think about things, when you say it's really hard, um, how we think about stuff, how our governments organize our planning tools, we're just not set up to tackle these kinds of multivariable, multi-sector optimization questions. Certain places in the world are a couple steps ahead. Um, I'd like to give a nod to uh, Europe, Germany, Denmark, <laughs> they've been thinking about this a long time, so we have a lot to learn from them. Uh, Australia, I think, has been on it for some time as an export commodity. But um, on the other hand, it's hard, but it's also a huge, huge opportunity for everybody involved, including the incumbent oil and gas industry, which is important, because if you want progress to happen fast, the fastest path to, prog to progress is one where everybody wins. Absolutely. And I was going to summarize our discussion, but I think that's such a great ending on there, Janice. So thank you guys so much for that engaging discussion. I really enjoyed it. It's a great topic to talk about, and I think we could all talk about it much, much longer. But thanks so much for joining us today for Zero Week Conversations, and I hope to be speaking with you soon.